So um, let us begin. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I think first of all we have to thank the BBC for hosting us in this remarkable building and I'm sure that all of you are here simply to listen to the intellectual content of the planning and not just to have a little route around the new broadcasting house. Uh, which is fantastic, but uh, thank you very much to the BBC for hosting us. Um, this is a new event for the APG, so it is a new, um, a new strand in our event series. So some of you may have been to Worlds Collide that we ran so successfully earlier this year. Some of you have been to some of our, our noisy thinking events. And um, as Sarah and I were kind of thinking about what might be another interesting thing to do, we got to this idea, which we have grandly called theoretical futures, I think largely based upon the fact that you know, planners by nature are curious people and I think many of us kind of wonder whether or not our skills could be used usefully elsewhere at all. And some of us may have thought, gosh, is the life outside of advertising and maybe something like media and broadcasting might be kind of interesting and engaging. So the measure of popularity for this event might all be that you all just hate your jobs and are desperate to get out and really, really want to work somewhere a bit more. <laughs> You, you, could, you could be doing this. You could be doing this. You're, you're, you're all feeling a bit less excited about doing it. Now, you? There we go. Some more fine BBC programming there. Excellent. <laughs> so it was an ITV product, so you can take Dan to task for that later on. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we will be hearing uh, this evening from three people, all of whom have worked in planning in various guises in the past and now find themselves uh, in broadcasting in various ways, albeit in planning roles within broadcasting, so we can all kind of work out what it might be like to be there. So um, the way the evening is going to run is that uh, these three guys will talk for around about an hour and then hopefully at 7.30 we will be uh, escorted on a tour around the building. We'll not be having too detailed a look at the BBC News area for, for reasons some of you may be aware of. Uh, so the tour will be slightly curtailed in that respect, but uh, we will see much of the rest of the building, I think, at that point. Um, just to talk about who we have then, so on the far end we have Dan Cook, who is uh, Director of Planning and Research at ITV, ex of the BBC and ex of uh, Planning and Agencies. We have uh, Claire Phillips, who is Head of Audience Research and Insight at Channel 4, uh, ex of Agencies, who used to work at AMV. Uh, we crossed over by about six months. Uh, very brief, uh, brief time there together. And finally, uh, Jane Lingham, who is Head of Audience Planning and Research at the BBC. I think at last saw when she was bridesmaid at my cousin's wedding, which is just <laughs> one of those, isn't this a small world kind of moments. Um, so I, without further ado, I will hand over to them. They will speak for around about an hour, as I say. We'll do some questions and then we'll all be hurried off on a tour. So um, I will hand over to Jane. Thank Lovely. you. Thanks, Craig. Um, so good evening everyone, uh, my name is Jane Lingham, I'm Head of Audience Planning and Brand Measurement at the BBC and I wanted to start this evening just by welcoming you to the BBC's newest building in central London, New Broadcasting House. Um, I'm sure as many of you are aware, uh, these are challenging times for the BBC, uh, there's quite a lot going on at the moment and I do want to acknowledge that um, just to start off with, but just to say that we're here this evening to talk about content and specifically how planning can influence brilliant content. So that's what we're going to focus on this evening. Um, and with that in mind, I wanted to start by playing you a film. The Olympics brings together the people of the world in harmony and friendship and peace to celebrate what is best about mankind. To every athlete waiting, ready, prepared to take part in these games. Welcome to London. There is a truth to sport, a purity, a drama, an intensity, a spirit that makes it irresistible to take part in and irresistible to watch. What we are seeing right now is that dreams do come true. London 2012 will inspire a generation. In every Olympic sport, there is all that matters in life. Humans stretch to the limit of their ability, living for the moment, but making an indelible mark upon history. The champion! Becomes a legend. For my 
fellow countrymen, I say thank you. Thank you for making all this possible. Jessica Ennis is the Olympic champion, best all-round athlete in the world. I have never been so proud to be British and to be a part of the Olympic movement. This is our time. And one day we will tell our children and our grandchildren that when our time came, we did it right. So, uh, I wanted to start off by playing you that film for a couple of reasons, actually. Um, the first one is it's just a lovely reminder of the brilliant summer of sport that we had this year, and hopefully some of you guys got to enjoy it as much as we did. Um, also, planning did help to shape some of the editorial of the Olympic coverage as well, and if we get a chance, we'll come on and talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, but perhaps more importantly, actually, London 2012 turned out to be one of the biggest broadcasting moments in recent history. So the BBC had over 27 million people tuning into the opening ceremony. And just to put that in context, for any EastEnders fans in the audience, we haven't had audiences that big since 1986 on Christmas Day when Dirty Den served divorce papers to Angie Watts, uh, and that pulled in about 28 million viewers. Um, and actually that was also when we had only around about four TV channels as well, so people had much less choice. So it was a significant moment for us um, during the Olympics this year. But we aren't here just to talk about the BBC, um, and as Craig mentioned, I'm joined by colleagues and friends, uh, Dan and Claire, who work at ITV and Channel 4 as well. Um, and by the time you leave here this evening, we hope to have spoken to you about three things. Um, we're going to start off by talking to you about why we think broadcasting needs planners. Now, planning is obviously traditionally the domain of advertising agencies. Um, some creative industries are waking up to the value of planning, but we're going to talk to you about particularly why we think planning is valuable in the world of broadcasting. Dan and I are then going to take you through what planning and broadcasting does. So what does the day job look like? Um, what, what is daily life like as a planner working within broadcasting? And then lastly, we're going to give you some examples of planning in action. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions. And as Craig said, we've then got some people that are going to come and give you the opportunity to do a tour of broadcasting house should you wish to do so. Um, so Claire is going to start us off by talking about why broadcasting needs planners. Um, I am new into the job at Channel 4 and I think it's actually quite interesting um, this evening actually that we've got planning represented at Channel 4, ITV and the BBC and there's also planning at um, Sky as well so I think what we're seeing is that broadcasters are recognising a need for the planning skill set because it's an incredibly competitive industry and I think they're recognising that planners can make the difference between success and failure. Um, one of the first things really to say is there are so many TV channels and content kind of begging for our attention. And in the same way that other sectors are ultimately about getting people to buy a product, TV is about getting people to view content. And that sounds really quite simple when you put it like that, but actually it's really, really hard because it's such a competitive marketplace. Um, firstly, there's competition from other channels, and there's hundreds of them, many of them doing exactly the same thing that your channel might be doing. I think it's definitely the most competitive marketplace I've ever worked in. So if you compare it to cereals or to cars or to cat food or something, there's so much more choice that you've got with working with TV brands. Secondly, there's loads of competition from other technology. So online doesn't just give you access to other channels from around the world, but it also gives you access to other content from other sources. Then there's competition that, from TV that we thought was kind of dead and gone, that used to be DVDs, and now it's about delayed viewing that we get on catch-up. And that's without factoring any of the other entertainment choices that you could be making instead of watching TV, and in a world where the different areas of entertainment are beginning to converge. So all that choice sounds like it's really brilliant for viewers and really bad for TV companies, but actually it doesn't work like that either for, for audiences. 
Um, there's a really good book, um, it's quite old now, by Barry Schwartz about the paradox of choice and in it he argues that actually greater choice paralyses people and that they find solace in these heavily restricted repertoires. And we know from our work in TV that, that generally the repertoire of people's channels is about eight. And that's really where brand planning comes in because channels um, need to help viewers navigate their way through this sea of choice and all of this content. And in order to do that, they need to present themselves in a clear and understandable way with very attractive identities which draw people towards them. And in other words, what we're doing is we're applying pretty classical planning techniques to broadcast. <clears throat> the other thing we've got is that um, there's a, a kind of even greater need, I think, for strong brands because there's this huge proliferation of channels that rely on kind of reheated TV programmes from other broadcasters. So whether that be Dave or Good Food or Comedy Central, there's actually quite a long list. And for these channels, the challenge is not just to make people head towards content they've already seen, but it's also to attempt to take ownership of it and often to try and bring some fairly disparate pieces of shows into a kind of coherent whole. And again, a kind of another classic planning task. So when I was at um, Red B, one of the channels that we worked on um, was Dave. And that was a, a, a channel that was then awarded with an um, IP Effectiveness Award because it kind of proved how you can take the same channel, same content, give it a different brand, and you see quite dramatic transformations in fortunes. I think it was about 4.5 million quid we earned in six months, so pretty um, substantial, pretty immediately. The other thing I think is really fascinating about working in broadcasting and really difficult is that not only is it hard to, to get people to your product, retaining them is incredibly difficult. And it's a sector where decisions of loyalty and disloyalty are made on a kind of second by second base, um, basis. At its best, what you've got with really good telly is you've got really, really sticky content and probably stickier than other sectors. So a must-watch programme can retain and can build an audience that other sectors might only dream about. But the challenge we've got is that simply to retain um, people throughout the programme is pretty difficult because barriers are constantly being thrown up to stop that happening. So, for example, ad breaks. Most of us flick. You know, you think, actually, maybe there's an opportunity to watch something better, so I'm going to um, change immediately. I mean, the remote control makes it very, very easy to do that. And again, I think there's not really many markets where it's very easy to kind of break loyalty within an instant. And then you've got the end of a TV program. Um, and how do you ensure that people stay on your channel and they don't go looking elsewhere? And that's really hard when you work for a commercial broadcaster. So Channel 4 is a weird broadcaster because it's public service, but it's funded by, it doesn't make a profit, but it's funded by commercials and advertising. And you've got a break within your, within your brilliant content where you're um, showing um, commercials. Um, and again, you know, planning becomes really central here to kind of build strong enough channel and programme brands that hold people throughout. Um, and when attention dips, holds the promise that things are going to improve. And again, these are kind of core skills of any planner. The other thing I really love about working in TV is that it's um, a market that's dominated by technology. And as technology evolves, um, what TV means also um, changes. And it's just interesting to see you know, the big technological players Google and Apple all moving into a TV space and all competing in the same sector that, that broadcasters once had as their own. And TV can't ignore that and it has to take account of this changing technological world and it has to shape it as well. So um, as I mentioned before, channels like YouTube are now Channel 4's competitive set as much as conventional channels. More and more people, especially younger people, are watching TV on their mobile so there's huge implications in this for the type of, of programme that works on, on mobile and the length of shows. At the moment, TV's wrestling with how to co-op social media more, and currently the attempts are quite basic. Um, but it's clear that so much of social media is underpinned by TV talk, that really TV needs to em embrace this much more fully than it has done. And again, people use other devices now when they're watching TV, so we've got this kind of, we haven't got such captive attention as we used to have, 
And again, it's another really fascinating opportunity to begin to understand how second screens can be incorporated into the TV offering. And again, these are quite early days and some of the advances into second screen technology and how we integrate second screen with the primary screen are actually quite basic, which means there's huge opportunities for planners to kind of um, develop that thinking and develop that, that product offering. Um, and again, I think as a final example, there are just huge implications for people watching TV as catch up um, more and more, not just for how we measure viewership, and we're obsessed in TV, wrongly at the moment, of measuring things in overnights, when actually increasingly so much of our watching is done later on catch up. But also it's quite interesting when we think about how do we drive people to programmes. And again, where commercial broadcasting is quite fascinating is that you've got different, um, different um, models, so different cost models. So the amount we can charge for driving people to linear is a lot more than we can get on catch up. And that's actually quite a challenge when the direction of travel is towards um, <coughs> on-demand viewing. And we're kind of going against, going against the trend. So I could go on, but all of, these, all of these areas, I think, are areas that require intelligence and audience understanding and strategic direction. And in other words, it's where planning is absolutely vital. And the other thing I think is just really important is that not only does... Um, TV or broadcasting need planning, but I think that um, planners um, mm. need TV. Um, and I think it's interesting that as more and more brands are trying to create content, um, TV is content that people of all generations, all ages, all classes actually want. And it's TV content that people seek out, and it's TV that people are passionate about and that they talk about. And actually, it's very difficult having worked on brands like Doctor Who or Homeland or a BBC rebrand um, or the Paralympics to contemplate a life back in advertising and working in FMCG. Jane. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, OK, so that's a little bit about the case for why we think um, broadcasting needs planning. But you might be wondering a little bit about, well, what is the job? What does it look like? What do you do day to day? What do your creative briefs look like? Um, and I guess planning in broadcasting is different to planning in advertising. And I think we, we can all say that because we've all been planners in advertising agencies. Um, and what we're going to do now is talk to you about what planning does in practice in the world of broadcast. And also, as we go through, we'll pull out some of the differences as we see them between being a planner in an agency um, and being a planner in the broadcasting industry. Um, and I guess the first thing to say is that planning and broadcasting is as much about helping to develop strategies for content itself as it is the marketing around that content. Um, now at the BBC, our remit is primarily about developing creative strategies for programmes themselves and for product ideas. So I'm going to focus on that. Um, and then Dan is going to talk to you about planning in the commercial sector and how it works there. Uh, but I wanted to start just by giving you a very brief history of planning in broadcasting. Um, because I think whilst planning has been around since the 1960s, generally, it actually only arrived in the world of broadcast in around about 2002. Um, and it actually started as a pilot in factual television at the BBC back then in 2002. Um, and off the back of that successful pilot, um, it was then rolled out into other areas of television. So we started to get planners in areas like <coughs> drama, um, working in children's. We then started to spread it out into other content areas, so it moved outside of television at the BBC. We got a planner who worked in radio, we've got planners that work in future media, um, and future media is the bit of the BBC that's responsible for development of all the BBC's <coughs> digital products. And what we've got now is, I think we have a team of about 16 planners at the BBC, which I think might make us one of the biggest planning departments in London. Um, uh, it's just arrived at ITV about a year ago, and Dan's going to talk to you about that. And with Claire, it has arrived at Channel 4 as well. And I guess like any discipline in its infancy, what planning actually has done over the last 10 years has been quite different. It's evolved over time. So when we first introduced planning at the BBC, the role was really about working with the people who were coming up with the programme ideas themselves, what we call the idea development teams. Um, and our role there was really to help inspire their thinking by running workshops with them, um, running trend sessions, and generally helping to inspire them come up with relevant and great ideas. But whilst we do still do some of that, what we realised quite quickly was that actually there's a bigger role to be done as well in terms of planning and broadcasting. And that's working with the people who are responsible for commissioning the ideas themselves um, and actually helping those guys to write the initial briefs 
against which the ideas people deliver. And now, particularly at the BBC, a lot of our efforts are directed towards helping to set that creative agenda up front, um, working with the people who run channels, who run products, uh, who run genre, and helping them to set their creative agenda. In fact, just to give you a bit more of an idea of the types of projects that we get involved in, um, this is a list of actual projects that we've worked on over the last six months. Um, this is just at the BBC. And what you'll see is that some of these questions that planning has helped to answer are quite big and strategic. So they're things like, what should science sound like on Radio 4? Very big, very broad question. Um, or how is drama on BBC One distinctive from drama on BBC Two? Other questions tend to be much more program or product specific. So things like, can you help us articulate the idea at the heart of a new digital news product? Or can you help us write a brief for the new dragon on Dragon's Den? And I guess whether the questions we help to answer as planners are very big and strategic or program specific, they're all really interesting areas for planners to get involved in. And the way that we get involved is by working with teams at different stages within the creative development cycle. Now, this is a very linear representation of a creative development process. Um, in practice, projects rarely look this neat and tidy, and I will come on and, and talk about that in a little moment. Um, it's also true to say that these stages look quite different between broadcasters, and actually even within broadcasters they can look different. So what the creative development process looks like in radio can be very different to what it looks like in television. Um, but basically, if you were trying to simplify the creative development process, it could be broken down into these five stages. So it starts off with strategic development. Someone decides that something needs to happen. Um, someone then goes away and comes up with some ideas to deliver against that need. It then moves into production, where the thing gets made. Uh, the product itself or the programme <coughs> is launched or broadcast. And once that's happened, a decision is made whether or not to bring it back. Um, or to review whether or not changes need to be made in order to bring it back for a second series, say, if it's a, a programme for television. And in public service broadcasting, um, our primary remit is to develop programme and product ideas themselves rather than the marketing of content. Um, and that means that we tend to get involved earlier in this creative development process in sort of the upfront stages when we're helping to set the creative agenda. So effectively, we work with researchers really closely, and that's very important. Um, we have in-house researchers um, within Channel 4, ITV and the BBC and all of the time we work hand in hand with planning and research. We also work with brand marketers and we work with business strategy teams as well um, and we help to set the creative agenda and write briefs up front with the channel controllers um, and the genre commissioners. We then work with development teams to help inspire them when they're coming up with ideas and making sure that their ideas are as relevant as they can be by informing them about the market or the content or the world generally. And we work with production teams to make sure that once ideas are being delivered, they get delivered on brief. And that's really important because very often in broadcasting, you know, from start to finish, you could be looking at a two or a four year um, lag between something getting commissioned and it getting made. So there's a lot of opportunity for it to kind of drift off brief in that amount of time. Um, we do also play a role helping to evaluate um, ideas as well. So once perhaps a programme or a series has played out or a product has been launched, we get involved in the conversation about what it actually did, whether it actually worked for our audiences. But again, as I said, we do that hand in hand with research. Um, in the commercial broadcast world, planning does work slightly differently. I think Dan will come on and talk to you about this, but it has more of a direct role working with marketing. Um, and Dan will talk about that in a moment. But before he does, I just wanted to touch on how being a planner in the broadcast sector is a bit different to being a planner in an agency. Um, and I suppose this is taken from first-hand experience. And I think the first big difference is that, that I noticed, is that when you're working client-side as a planner <coughs> within broadcasting, you aren't ever really given a formal brief or an actual problem to go away and solve, um, unlike you might be in an ad agency. And I know sometimes in an ad agency it doesn't work perfectly either, um, but it certainly was noticeable that that happens much, more, much less often in broadcasting than it did in agency life. Um, in fact, as a planner at the BBC, certainly, very often you are the person who ha actually has to spot where there's a problem. Um, once you've spotted that there's a problem, you have to convince the stakeholder that there is a problem. You then have to convince them you're the right person to solve the problem. Then you have to go away and solve it, and then you have to come back and persuade them of your recommendations. Um, and that really means that you have to be quite entrepreneurial in the way that you go about your work. It also means that you have to build incredibly strong relationships with people in the organisation, because you need to stay up to date with what's going on in order to influence it. I suppose the other big difference um, when it comes to briefings is that 
We don't tend to write creative briefs for content in broadcasting the way that you might do as a planner in an ad agency. So at the BBC, we do write what we call our strategy on a page um, or our brand blueprint. Um, and that looks something like this. Uh, and basically, the blueprint sets out what we're trying to achieve against a set number of criteria. So in it, we articulate things like, what's the ambition for the programme? <coughs> How will it be judged? Are there cultural trends which the idea plays into which we can trade off? Um, and you'll also recognise lots of areas on there as being very similar to what you would write in a creative brief in an ad agency. Um, particularly things like, what's the audience sweet spot? Um, here we call it, what's the programme essence? But very similar to kind of, what's the proposition on your brief? But the big difference is that when we write these programme blueprints in broadcasting, we write them very much in collaboration with the writers and the production teams. Um, and the point of creating these blueprints is really to make sure that everyone involved in developing an idea is absolutely clear about the idea which sits behind that idea. And that's really important because very often, what I've found certainly is that you can be working on a project with up to 20 or 30 stakeholders, um, which means that there's lots of room for error if everyone isn't in agreement about what you're trying to do up front. Um, I guess what I'm saying effectively is that as a, as a planner in broadcasting, we sit at the heart of a matrix of relationships. And a really big part of our role is making sure that everyone is aligned behind a common idea. Um, a couple of other differences worth mentioning. The first is that, um, and I've already touched on this, but unlike perhaps in an agency where there's a more linear creative development process, um, it is definitely less structured in program making. Now, I showed you the five basic stages of creative development. Uh, I also mentioned that in practice it rarely looks that neat and tidy. Now, all of those five stages in creative development do absolutely take place, but they don't necessarily happen in an organised or structured way. Um, they're not necessarily formalised in the way that they might be if you're working in an agency, which means that very often decisions get made in the lift or over lunch. Uh, which means that as a planner you have to work really, really hard to build relationships with the right people um, so that they continually pull you into the process and invite you in and allow you to contribute and influence the end product and make it more effective. Um, and lastly, this is, this is probably a bit glib, but I wanted to mention it anyway. Um, when I went client-side and joined the BBC, one of the really big differences that I noticed is how much harder it is to make people listen to your ideas when they don't pay for them. Um, and by that, I mean that as a planner in an agency, you're effectively a revenue stream. So you have a charge out rate. Clients know that they pay for you. They know how much they're paying for you, which means that when you have something to say, they listen. Um, when you work client side, you're effectively all working for the same organisation, which means that you have to work really, really hard um, to avoid just being another voice in the room. So being knowledgeable and insightful about something which your stakeholders aren't, whether or not that's the audience or the market or content itself, is really vital. So those are a few observations from my point of view. Um, Dan is now going to talk about planning in the commercial sector and touch on how he's experienced some of those differences at ITV. Thank you. Um, cash, that's quite a nice segue into the commercial sector, really, <laughs> yeah. into ITV. Um, as Jane says, I, mean, I was way back in that timeline um, was one of the people, Justin Bramian, Ben Stewart, Matt Godfrey, Holly Goodyear, amongst others, who set up planning at, at, at the BBC. And last year, I joined ITV to set up planning there, slightly Groundhog Day. Um, but the, the difference between planning in a commercial environment and planning in a, in a publicly funded environment, there are some, some similarities, but equally, that's profoundly different. And I hope this image can sort of illustrate the point this is the uh, interior of the, uh, one of the space shuttles. Um, I'm not sure which one. Uh, mankind used to have a reusable space vehicle, um, but we don't anymore. It's been grounded. Uh, we used to have commercial supersonic air travel that could take you to London to New York in three and a half hours. But of course, we don't anymore. Uh, the Concorde's been grounded. Twelve men walked on the moon, but none in the lifetimes of looking around, almost all of the people in this room, anyone under 40. And these are all examples that technology, or at very least the application of technology, can move forward as well as move backward. And it's also a reminder that increasingly in a commercial world, and at ITV, our commercial imperative is an absolute imperative. Um, you know, governments have retreated from manned space flight. 
lumbering jumbo jets are more cost efficient than sleek Concords, and of course there was no gold on the moon. Uh, at ITV, audience planning isn't a nice to have. It, it, it needs to demonstrably and empirically contribute to the bottom line. It needs to contribute to both the creative and the commercial health of the organisation. <clears throat> so how does it work at ITV? And I'll go for, through these four main areas, but essentially it's about increasing the hits and reducing the misses. And we do this via cultural forecasting, targeted development, risk management, and targeted marketing. So to go through each of these in turn, traditional audience research in television organisations has largely relied on BARB, which I'm sure you're familiar with as a set-top box that, that's very good at telling you what people did watched and did last night. Um, it's less good at telling you what people feel and think. And audience planning is, is very much taking what they did uh, and, and watched as a starting point, is very much concerned with what people think or feel. And we think understanding that gives you a commercial, gives you a commercial advantage. If you understand what people think or feel or want or need or hope or fear <laughs> better than your competitor, you can create programs that they love that play more neatly into the zeitgeist, for want of a better word, um, and they'll come to you and abandon your, your competitors and your chairman will be thrilled. Um, however, it's not enough to understand what audiences think and feel today. Commissioning timelines can extend from current affairs is generally pretty quick turnaround, for better or for worse, um, uh, which can be sort of three months, uh, entertainment out to a year, drama, two to three years, and natural history pieces can be literally eons in the making. Um, so it's understanding where, where the sort of culture is moving to, so that when your commission lands, it lands in the right kind of frame of mind. So cultural forecasting isn't um, a black box, it's not a groundhog day, it's not sort of staring into tea leaves. Nor is it um, trend watching, although trend watching is a significant part of it or a useful part of it. There are quite a lot of companies which can tell you what next year's new black will be, but that's not terribly useful for trying to understand the direction of travel for X Factor or Strictly Come Dancing or, or, or audiences to other big existing shows and crucially to, to new shows. So cultural forecasting, as I say, understanding where the cultural landscape is moving to which is about understanding where the forces in society, if you like, the technological, economic, um, changes to household, changes to uh, demographics, where they're moving and crucially how they intersect and what those intersections, how they're shifting. Um, if you don't look at how the stuff intersects, if you just concentrate on a single example, then you tend to over-predict some behaviours and under-predict under predict others. And, and I'm sure that some of you will disagree about this next point, being in a room full of planets. Um, disagreeing is what we do at our finest. Um, but all new television sold in the last three years, um, and many before that, have been internet capable. You've been able to very easily plug the internet into the back of your TV. Even nowadays, just plug a dongle in, which makes your internet, you make sure your main TV a wireless internet um, uh, uh, access point. And that's quite extraordinary. Instantly, you can have a near infinite <coughs> list of entertainment possibilities. And here are just a tiny, tiny handful of the legal ones. Um, there's vast amounts more beyond that. And, and, and all this at a, you know, effectively zero cost of entry. And yet less than 8% of UK households have accessed, of UK individuals have accessed video on demand through a television set, through the main new proud of flat screen. In the, in, the, in the living room. A lot of video on demand is accessed through um, laptops and tablets, through the iPlayers and ITV players, etc. But I'm talking about the main TV. Um, and indeed, most of those 8% only did it once or twice. So internet on TV isn't really, doesn't really seem to be, to be taking off. And the interesting thing is, mid-decade, the technologist saw this change in the technology and the, in the underlying technolog technological infrastructure that makes this available. But they sort of ignored some crucial aspects of people. I think because they concentrated on one thing and saw a fundamental change in 
the technological capabilities. They assumed a fundamental change in human needs. And of course, fundamentally, we don't change that much. And here is total viewing since 2005. This is actually average hours of viewing per day, but you can cut total viewing any way you like. Television viewing is going up and up and up. Both live television viewing, um, Vosdale, which is time shifted by, but watched on the same day, so plus ones, um, and two to seven day, which is the window in which most PVR TV gets used. Usually it's not used after seven days, eventually it gets knocked out the back. So linear television is incredibly rude health. Scheduled television is incredibly rude health, and yet we were told we will all be furiously Facebooking in the living room. Of course, nobody wants to put their Facebook up in the living room, do they? <laughs> Um, so we still need stories as people, we, as families we still need to gather and warm our hands in front of the electronic hearth. Um, as friends we still want stuff to share and, to, and the cultural and social capital that comes with sharing relevant information which we all have a source of stake in. And of course that only works if you're all watching the same things at the same time. You might be watching them in different households but you're watching them according to the schedule. And linear and, and the other thing about programs that we want, we want to talk about, we want to engage with them, is that we want them when we want them. And the reason peak is peak is because that's when most people are available in that sort of frame of mind to watch those sort of programs. Daytimes is daytimes. There's a different human need in daytime TV and it's a much more fractious viewing, etc. 9 p.m. is the special shots slot for commissioners. It's when most of the money is spent because, of course, that's when most of the people are watching TV. So. Linear original scheduled television, despite the futurist claims, works best by giving us actually quite a narrow range of choices. I think someone talked about the paradox of choice earlier. And this, uh, Claire indeed talked about the paradox of choice earlier. Um, and this, this is, the, you know, it is a relatively narrow range that we choose from, despite the thousands of channels available on Sky and indeed the millions and billions of channels available just by going into the internet. I mean, the truth is that they fail to understand that people want to watch the best television on television. And the best television is brought to you by companies that spend a lot of time trying to understand your needs. So I'll move now to targeted development, which is really about understanding audience needs. And alongside cultural forecasting, it's about trying to understand audience needs now and as they unfold. And, and indeed, how those, how those needs change. Um, and this is looking at some television forms, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, you might not be so familiar with Paul O'Grady, unless you're an ITV viewer, but I'll come to him. Um, we're in a recession, and we've been in a recession for two or three years. Um, the culture tends to lag a bit behind the economy. So the fact that Lehman Brothers went down doesn't mean that suddenly we all want different types of TV. But as, as we move in, into, and indeed we'll at one point out of a recession, the culture tends to lag a bit behind the main uh, economic changes. However, in, um, so, so what does it mean to be in a recession? It means slightly smaller budgets for program makers, but that's, that's all right. But it does mean changes in what audiences want. And we can evidence this. In 2008, 2009, um, the moment the recession started to bite, we saw what you might call manufactured conflict television being the wife swaps or big brothers in which uh, uh, people are cast deliberately to be antagonised one another. They're very carefully edited so that there's looks like a lot more conflict actually than there often is in these shows. Those programmes really fell off a cliff, um, really quite dramatically. Audiences just fled from them. It, 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 it caused Channel 4 a few problems at the time. Um, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is old TV. I'm talking, new TV's different. Um, I think, I think in, uh, equally, you, you're seeing a sort of uh, uh, outward ripples of, of changes in taste. The Apprentice uh, lost two million viewers. Um, and I'm going to talk about my own failings as well. well uh, before me, ITV's own failings, of course. Um, the Apprentice lost two million viewers uh, 2000 and, between 2011 and 2012. Uh, young Apprentice was down. I'm talking to the planner. I won't mention the Young Apprentice. I'm clearly in the wrong building to be talking about BBC weakness. Is 
Um, but I think what we're seeing, uh, uh, here we have um, red or black, the largest cash payout in, U in UK television history, 1.5 million pounds was won by one person on the roll of a, well, it was a roulette kind of wheel thing. Highly skilled, <laughs> highly skilled for roulette <laughs> pool. Um, 1.5 million pounds, extraordinary amount of figure, was watched by 3.5 million people. Um, so I think, I think what we're seeing here is collectively we're turning our backs on some television forms which we enjoyed very much during the sort of mid-decade wealthier time of the decade when we all felt a bit more flush and a bit more confident. And we're turning away from that sort of greed, cynicism, from manipulation. I think we're turning away from fame in quotation marks. I think we're turning away from fakery and from the sense that the fix is in. And I think what we're turning to is much more home and hearth much more make, do and mend kind of, kind of programs, much more pro programs about the knowable and doable and domestic, um, in which joy, surprise, 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 is an ITV format which has come back and is doing spectacularly well. It's just unbridled joy. Um, uh, programs in which, in, which, in which things like Paul O'Grady's um, For the Love of Dogs, which was Paul O'Grady who really does love dogs, uh, <laughs> on the Battersea Dat what Daddy's dog's home and finding families for dogs. This is half an hour a night on ITV and it was doing five and a half million viewers, which for ITV Factual is a really spectacularly big number. Um, equally, BBC Two's um, Bake Off uh, peaked in its final at 7.2 million, which is you know, bigger than current Top Gear figures and it's a program about cupcakes. I mean, really, <laughs> really quite extraordinary figures against things which I don't think either of those pro shows would have survived a minute in 2005, 2006. Equally, I think if you tried to launch Y-Swap now, it would die a, a death pretty quickly. So that's cultural forecasting. Um, the other thing that we do, if that, those two bits were about trying to increase the rate of hits, then this is about trying to decrease the rate of misses at ITV. We've just shifted from a, a, a disparate range of panels to YouGov panel, um, which we now have all our 450,000 panelists on YouGov which, with which we um, can generate qualitative um, insights about our programs. And we went with YouGov because they're, they're specialists in understanding the sort of underlying cultural mood of the country. Hence, um, the Prime Minister has a YouGov dashboard on his iPad, which he checks every morning about you know, how people feel about him, um, uh, uh, I'm told. Um, uh, uh, so YouGov, you know, YouGov if, if most market research companies are about trapping you in a mall and asking you questions until you, until you escape, or indeed you know, phoning you up and asking you questions until you just hang up in fury, then YouGov's is very different. They're an online panel and they treat their panellists very differently and indeed a lot of YouGov panellists are really highly motivated in Malcolm Gladwell's terms, Mavens, if anyone remembers that book from that point in the decade, uh, in the decade gone. But people who, who are interested in new things and think that they want to have an influence on government, have an influence on institutions, etc. Um, and so YouGov, as I say, we've got 450,000 panellists uh, which we can conduct qual, which we call industrial qual. It's, it's, it is uh, qualitative work at an amazing scale. And it's risk management in that we can put three million quid into a six-part drama, um, uh, make the thing, shoot the thing, schedule the thing, and on night, you know, the night of the first TX, cross your fingers that this is going to work and it's going to generate an audience. Uh, equally, we can spend a fraction of that money on a pilot, on a good quality broadcast pilot, and we can test that with very large numbers of, of, of viewers and just, just check that the conceit is right, just check that the timing's right, just check that, that it's the right shape. Um, and finally, targeted marketing, finally. Um, and this is about helping, helping marketeers understand the intention of the program to audience. So planning, helping define that, and then making sure that what we take to market is how we intend, we, 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 how we anticipate and have planned, indeed, that the program will work with an audience. So not to take the wrong message, um, which, which can quite, ha quite uh, uh, happen quite often, particularly if marketing is, 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 a, is a very late consideration in the program development process. So um, what I'm just going to take you very quickly here is uh, an incredibly Jane hit a circle. 
Uh, mine's even more linear than, than linear. Um, uh, and, and obviously, because we're ITV and everything works according um, to a timetable, and we're not BBC and we don't just have lunch and uh, <laughs> make a decision and then, you know, the lift. What do you think? I don't know. Um, but because we're a science, of course, at, 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 uh, 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 <laughs> Yes, because at ITV we have a commercial imperative, and the commercial imperative means a lot, a lot. As I say, you know, there's, there, is, there is risk, and, and risk is very real. I mean, you know, when things fail, they really, really hurt at ITV. Um, so what we have here is high engagement, low engagement on the, on the vertical axis and across the bottom time, and across the top of that, the various stages in the commissioning cycle laid out in a scientific and uh, linear fashion. Um, and the sort of different involvement. So planning's involvement is, is absolutely involved in commissioning development, comes a bit less so off during the pitch and production process, not really involved at the moment of transmission because there's really nothing we can do by that point. Um, but, under, but evaluation planning is very much involved in did the program achieve the audience that, it, that we said it would achieve, that it set out to achieve? And again, with commercial audiences, we trade different audiences at different costs, at different, they have different values. So has this show worked with the audience that it needs to work with and then into a recommission or no recommission decision? Um, marketing is less involved upstream, but of course is enormously involved as we move into production and as we move into, tra into transmission, particularly just pre-transmission is when marketing's at its most um, compelling to get people to the show, evaluation and recommission. And at that point, that sort of marketing and research crossover, it's, that's when the point of understanding the, the intention of the show towards the audience, that's when that information is passed or discussed. Um, and finally, audience research, less involved up front, but of course enormously involved in the evaluation and, um, well, in transmission, evaluation and recommission decisions. And that's um, ITV. Brilliant. Um, okay, so we're, we're nearly at the end. Um, so far we've talked to you about why we think planning needs, uh, broadcasting needs planning. Um, I think you'll agree we've talked quite collegiately about what we do as planners uh, in broadcasting. Um, what we wanted to leave you with was just some examples of, of kind of planning in action. Um, and I guess at any given moment in time, there are always loads of interesting questions that, that planners are working on. Um, a couple of things that we're doing at the moment, we're, um, I was talking to one of the planners earlier today, and she's working on a refresh of the Crime Watch format. Um, we've got a brilliant new drama that we're working on, which is going to land in 2014, and we're kind of helping the production team to work out exactly um, what the essence is of that drama and what kind of perhaps some of the relationships should be like between characters. Um, we're also helping to develop the big idea behind a new digital product um, for factual and learning. Um, so we've kind of talked to you about what we do, why we think it works, but you don't just have to take our word for it. And the last thing we wanted to do was to play you a film with some of our stakeholders talking about why they value planning in the world of broadcasting. What we're doing now in production at the BBC is putting much greater store on who is the audience, what is their unmet need? How big is that opportunity? How do we find them? How do we best serve them? How do we make this piece of content as impactful as possible? And planning is central to that going forward. In the BBC, R&D has a way in which it defines the technical future of the BBC. The harder part is to define the audience's future and its future relationship. Planning is helping us sort of work the bit just beyond, just at the horizon that we know is coming they're helping us get there quicker. I've been tasked with the job of trying to support creativity and innovation amongst uh, producers uh, from a commissioning point of view. Uh, so I asked uh, Planning to help us with that. Uh, and they've been brilliant at providing me with uh, a strategy and a focus and structure in order to do that. Um, one of the tasks was to improve the quality of ideas that we're pitched in BBC commissioning. And so far that has already improved. So my offer really is an offer from me and Hillary Joint, if Hillary were to come in. Working with planning allowed me to feel like it gave me a grounding um, to, in order to be creative and make, um, take risks and make decisions. Um, but, it, but it also gives you some language as well to, to, to talk about uh, why you make particular, you know, those decisions in particular. <laughs> Thank you.
And the real skill of working with planning was bringing together Radio 1 as a big brand that had its own clear objectives for what it wanted to do in Hackney and learning and we clearly have outcomes that we need for learning and was trying to find a way where we could marry those and use that as a way of then assessing the editorial ideas as they were developed. What the planners have been brilliant at doing is bringing together um, uh, interested parties, stakeholders from across the whole BBC, um, creative thinkers, people who have audience insight, financial understanding, to bring all those threads together, um, organise our creative thinking, putting audiences first and the quality of our creative output and coming up with a coherent plan. They are in-house, um, so they have the knowledge around content and also the relationships. And given you know, the huge volume of stuff that we have to work with, those two things are critically important. Molly. I'm just going out. There you are. I've got a lunch date. Cancel it, you're having lunch with me. What? On Sherlock, what we did was take a look at the pilot, um, listen to what some audiences thought about it, and put it into a way that could be communicated to the team, and it made a really radical difference to the show. Broadcasting hasn't until recently been a place where planning is necessarily um, recognised, and creativity is very much regarded as the lifeblood of the organisation. So in some ways it's the ultimate proof of planning, it's uh, adding value in a place where people are quite sceptical as to what it brings. We know the programmes could be updated, refreshed, but we don't quite know where that journey is going to take us, and we can use the planning department planners again to simply help us uh, understand where the audience is in relation to the programmes they make. It's too easy to become trapped in a little silo um, of your own, or your own kind of departments and your own area and your own workload and your own output uh, and it's really helpful when you're trying to get out of that to be able to draw on a resource that can help you see the bigger picture better than you might otherwise. They're absolutely a core part of the CBBC Productions team. They provide us with really, really valuable insights and fantastic expertise when it comes to helping to ensure not just the success of new projects but the ongoing success of strands that the audience is already very, very fond of. <clears throat> um, so that's it. That's the formal part of us talking at you. I think we've got about 10 minutes, so we're happy to take questions, but thank you very much. <coughs>